Wait for one of the... Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis, and today we're picking up our part two uh, on eschatology uh, with Dean. He's on the other line with us, uh, Dean Davids, Davis. Dean Davis? Dean Davis. Yes. I almost wanted to give him a David son, but we won't. Uh, uh, he's on the other line. Uh, we're talking about ecclesi- ecclesiology, eschatology, the study of the end times. All those times. E words. Uh, we, we did the, the beginning. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll let Michael pick up what we did last week, but before we do that, or last week, yesterday, but before we do that, I want to let you guys know a little bit about Remnant Radio, who we are. A little tongue tied today. A little bit. That's okay. Uh, you know, you speak in tongues enough and you just get tongue tied in the middle <laughs> oh of the day. That didn't goodness. happen. I'm just kidding, guys. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We stream every Monday night, 8 30. I did it again. Remnant Radio is a theology <laughs> broadcast. We stream at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We come out with regular shows uh, with pastors and teachers from different churches and denominations, Presbyterians, Anglins, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, uh, uh, the whole lot. Our goal is to suspend our presupposition, get outside of our theological echo chamber, and learn from our Christian brothers and sisters uh, that are outside of our denominational borders. If you're blessed by the ministry, you enjoy the ministry, you can give in the link that is found in the description. Uh, or uh, you can give on Patreon and become a weekly giver. Uh, looks like uh, we lost connection and we're back on. That's perfectly fine. Michael, you want to tell <laughs> us about last week's episode because I can't get through a sentence? I think I threw Josh off right before the show because I, I came in with a hat and he had to adjust the lighting so my face wasn't dark and you guys could see. Because uh, I know oh, you're all, for saving all me. I appreciate very, that. very concerned about seeing my face. So. Um, so, uh, yeah, we had a great show yesterday with Dean Davis. Uh, he wrote this book here called The High King of Heaven, a very, very good book. Now, I know it's thick, but even if you want to use it as a reference book, I mean, use it for that. It's amazing. And uh, and he has it on Kindle for like three bucks. So um, yesterday, he just he talked about the, the nature of the kingdom of God, how that plays into eschatology, and also talked about uh, the Old Testament kingdom prophecies? Do you interpret them figuratively or literally? And uh, we walked through that. So make sure you check out yesterday's episode. Uh, and and today we have two more topics. One is the millennium and two is the consummation. So I was worried coming. which figure you were going to put up, Michael. Yeah. I was really concerned. <laughs> So, but these these four issues in specific, if we can resolve these four issues, we can figure out eschatology and and what we should be thinking about it. But these four issues, the nature of the kingdom, Old Testament kingdom prophecies, the millennium, and the consummation. So we've worked through two of them. We're going to work through two more today. And Dean, I understand that you want to go through the millennium quickly, which just makes me want to laugh. It's a thousand (laughs) years. Dean, <laughs> how, how are you going to how are you going to skim over that? And because then, it's symbolic for him, there you, oh, right? There you it's symbolic of and, five minutes. And for those of you who are like, "Hey, you guys are doing an amillennial episode," just know you can go back into our archives and watch tons of other eschatology episodes. Uh, we've done episodes on postmillennialism. We've done episodes on the pre-trib, the post-trib, the mid-trib, the post-trib pre-rap. We did the pre-rap. Somebody was like, thing. "Somebody was like, you need to get yeah. Dr. Alan Kirshner on the show." I was like, "Check, had him <laughs> done." Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, but now to toss it over to you, would you pick up where we left off and kind of walk us through uh, these next steps uh, in understanding eschatology? Dean, are you with us? said you should never try to put the ocean in a teacup, <clears throat> but I'm <laughs> going to shoot for that today. And uh, we're going to talk a little about the millennium. As I do, I will be touching on some of the previous topics that we touched on yesterday. Let me offer couple of preliminary words about the revelation as a whole, as I see it. First of all, I think you all know that it's apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature in scripture is a kind of literature that surveys the course of salvation history and typically uses symbolism, images, sometimes numbers, in order to symbolize the progress of salvation history. It's an important fact because I want to emphasize that the revelation is a book of symbols. The second point is that it is indeed a book of signs. If you read Revelation 1, 1 through 3, you will see that God gave the revelation to his son Jesus, and he sent and signified it by his angel to the apostle John. 
The Greek word there is semino, which means to signify or to speak in signs. So you know right away that this book is loaded with symbolism, and the proper way to interpret both the images and the numbers, which we're going to get into in just a sec, is symbolically rather than literally. Third point I want to make, which we touched on yesterday, is that the revelation is what I call the grand finale of Scripture. I do not classify it as part of what we called yesterday the didactic New Testament. It's a grand finale of Scripture that brings in all of the great doctrines of the Bible and especially of the New Testament. I do not believe it is designed to teach any new doctrines. If there was a literal thousand-year reign of Christ that was sandwiched in between the era of gospel proclamation and the new heavens and the new earth, you would expect to see it in the didactic New Testament, the gospels, in the book of Acts, and in the epistles. Nowhere, underline nowhere, in the didactic New Testament do you find any mention of a thousand-year reign of Christ. In Revelation, we do, but it's a symbolic representation of the era of proclamation. The implication being that we are living in the millennium now. So with that as preliminary, let me just go into the chapter itself. First of all, a few words about the thousand years. And then I'm going to take you on a little short day hike through the entire chapter. I won't open the scripture and I won't go through it word by word, time doesn't permit. But we'll just give you a little fly over here. And a date night. I like the date night. A date night sounds delightful. A date night in the millennium. A that date sounds... night in the... Man, that sounds like a title for uh, your new book. <laughs> a date night in the millennium. Okay, keep going, sorry. You ready for the day hike, brothers? <laughs> all right. First of all, a thousand years. Let's just think about a thousand in the Old Testament, the number thousand symbolizes magnitude. Um, I was thinking today about it. You remember the expression, Saul slew his thousands, David his ten thousands. It's obviously designed to communicate magnitude or greatness. So this tells us that the era of gospel proclamation during which Christ is reigning from heaven is going to be a long time. It's going to be longer than most Christians expect and certainly much longer than the Christians in the, at the very beginning of the church era expected. And that has proven to be true. It's lasted 2,000 years. But I think there's a deeper significance to the number 10,000 or to the number 1,000. You can divide it up as 10 times 10 times 10. So you have 3 times 10. 3 is the number of the Trinity, and 10 is the number of completeness. So basically, I, what I see in this number, it's the thousand years is the period of time in which the Trinity completes the application of the redemption that Jesus Christ accomplished for us on the cross. Christ is ruling and reigning of he from heaven, and one of his great purposes is to gather in his elect from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation— and it's going to take a long time for him to bring in the fullness of his people, and it's symbolized by a thousand years. Now, what is the evidence for this? I want to try to persuade some of my beloved premillennial brothers out there, <laughs> give you a little evidence here. First of all, we have the teaching of the didactic New Testament on the structure of the kingdom of God. This is what we went into yesterday. And I want to invite all your listeners to go back and read the mysteries of the kingdom, Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4, and go through them and you will see that the Lord Jesus is teaching that the kingdom of God enters the world in two stages. The kingdom of the Son, which is a time during which the seed of the word of God goes out, it lands on different soils, different people respond in different ways. But those who are of a noble and a good heart, according to the Gospel of Luke, respond and they bring forth fruit abundantly. This is the first phase of the kingdom. Then you have the second coming of Christ, which is portrayed in the parable of the wheat and the tares and also the dragnet. And at that time, all that is evil and wicked is cast out of the kingdom. 
and the sons of the kingdom shine in the glory of their father's kingdom. They shine like the sun in its strength in the glory of the father's kingdom. All throughout the New Testament, if you'll read my book, I must cite 15 different New Testament texts showing that the kingdom of God comes into history in two simple stages. So that's the first proof of the truth of the millennial, a millennial interpretation. The second is the structure of the book. And I think, Josh, you have a diagram that you'd like to show the people. So I'm going to ask you to put that up right now. And it'll be helpful if you folks can view it. You see here that the entire book is broken up into one, two, three, four, five blocks. And I've named these five blocks with reference to Jesus Christ in his exaltation, the high king of heaven. So block one, which you find in chapter one, John receives a vision of the high king. In chapters two and three, the high king gives a message to the seven churches of Asia. And those seven churches of Asia symbolize the whole universal church. So you, if you listen to the seven messages, the whole church is going to profit because Christ has told us pretty much everything that the church needs to know to function fruitfully and victoriously in the world. Chapters four through five, I believe, are the center of gravity of the book and the most important is the central part of the book. I call it the investiture of the high king. What you have up there in symbolic language is what the Lord Jesus himself refers to in Matthew 28. The exalted Christ receives all authority in heaven and earth for the purpose of applying or administering the salvation that he accomplished upon the earth. The scroll that he receives from the Father's hand, I believe, represents a last will and testament and he is entrusting to Christ the unsealing of the scroll. In other words, Jesus has to apply this redemption until finally the scroll is able to be fully unrolled and the saints receive the new heavens and the new earth, which you see in Revelation 21 and 22. Now, here's the critical part for our study today. I've broken up chapter 6 through 20 and called it the high king's heavenly reign in other words these chapters are dealing what happens between his first coming and his second coming this era of proclamation so chapter 6 and 7 give you the seven seals at the end of the sixth chapter you have a symbolic representation of the second coming of christ in the seventh chapter, you get a symbolic representation of the new heavens and the new earth. Then you have chapters 8 through 11. You have the seven trumpets. At the end of chapter 11, you have another representation of the second coming of Christ. Chapters 12 through 4, you have the woman and the dragon. And there again, at the end of chapter 14, you have another representation of the second coming of Christ. 15 through 16, you have the seven balls. Same thing is true. At the end of chapter 16, you have a representation, if not exactly of his second coming, you know that it's the last judgment. Some great cosmic thing happens, and there is a transition away from the present age into the kingdom, into the kingdom age. Then in the, the 20th is, the, of course, the point of debate here. Does that 20 belong in the column underneath all the rest, or should we push it out to the right as an intermediate stage of the kingdom of God? Well, you can see just numerologically, it makes much more sense for it to be with the other five. You have six representations of the course and character of the high king's heavenly reign, which kind of correspond to the six days of creation. Uh, Jesus is recreating the world through the proclamation of the gospel. And so I think, and many amillennial commentators agree that, or I agree with them because they thought of it before me. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the, we all believe that that chapter 20 describes the course of the high king's heavenly reign. And then in 21 to 22, you get the, day, the Sabbath rest of the creation Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit and the angels and all the saints are now 
entering into their full inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth. So bottom line, I think that the structure of the book is one of the most powerful testimonies to the fact that the thousand years symbolize the present era of gospel proclamation. Okay, with that said, very quickly, I want to go over the four uh, pericopes, the four paragraphs, the four main sections of the Revelation. You must have a zillion questions pouring in on their chat line here, but uh, we'll, we'll find out in a minute. We do. We have some questions and some dispensationalists talking trash. I know. I'm <laughs> Wait, <laughs> what? We're doing an episode on eschatology, and dispensationalists are getting upset. <laughs> no, that's, that's kind no, of, no that, not that, not true upset. Technically, not really upset. They're just our regular viewers. Yeah, uh, we, literally that's what we every do. eschatology position or any such. We all talk trash position, to each other. That's, that's what we do. Family gets to do that. Yes, that's right. Uh, Go ahead. Well, we're getting out of our theological echo chambers today. Hey, so that's yeah, right. hey. there you go. Picking up Sounds on the tagline. Really there you go. <laughs> all right. So you ready? Let's yes, we are. Section 21 through 3, I entitled that The Binding of Satan. And the essence of the amillennial interpretation is that Satan is bound from deceiving the nations for two specific purposes. He cannot deceive the nations to such an extent that the elect of God cannot come in and find salvation. Satan is bound from deceiving them from rejecting Christ. Christ will bring his people successfully to himself. The second thing is, you see this later in the chapter, when he is released, he is once again empowered, if you will, to deceive the nations in order to come up against the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So he will be released at the end of the present evil age for what I call the last battle, the final assault of the unified world system against the church. The second section is the reign of the saints for the 1,000 years. This is probably the most difficult and complex part of it, but again, I'm just going to be very brief. I'll give you the AML viewpoint. I defend this at great length in the book. What John is seeing is the souls of the saints who have been true to Christ who have not received the mark of the beast. They haven't expressed supreme loyalty to the government, to the state, but they've been faithful. They have died, and their soul has entered heaven and therefore experienced the first resurrection. The first resurrection is not the new birth, I don't think. Augustine believed that, but I don't think that's it. I believe it is a resurrection of their spirit to the perfection of spiritual life in heaven. In other words, they enter the intermediate state. And so they're ruling and reigning up there, not over somebody, but they're ruling and reigning in life, as Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 5. They're, they're ruling and reigning over the world and the flesh and the devil that formerly tempted them and stumbled them. But now their, their soul is perfect, and they're ruling and reigning in the fullness of life. But as disembodied spirits, it says that judgment is given to them. Uh, Premillenarians say they have some kind of authority to judge during the millennium. But I think the meaning of that is that they have been uh, privileged to participate in the last judgment, which the Lord Jesus Christ will accomplish at the end of the age. The third section is the last battle and the judgment of Satan. So at the end of the thousand years, Satan goes out to the four corners of the earth. And I want to say to my beloved post-millennial brothers that I do not think this, this section encourages the post-millennial view. By the time you get to the end of the age, it looks like the great mass of humanity is pretty much hardened against the gospel with the result that most of the people in the world respond to the, the uh, enticements of the Antichrist and the, and the one world order that he will try to establish, and they will attack the saints. This is called the last battle. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. I noticed that, that, he, get, that he gathers Gog and Magog. Notice that he gathers them against the camp of the saints, and the beloved city. That tells you that it's a, a symbolic representation. When the Israelites went through the wilderness in Sinai, the Amalekites attacked the camp of the saints. 
later on in the reign of, oh golly, who was it? Uh, I forget which king it was, but the Assyrians attacked the beloved city and the Lord came down and destroyed them by plague. So the Holy Spirit is using Old Testament images to describe this great last battle that the church will be experiencing. Uh, we'll probably have some good questions on that one, I can imagine. Last one, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. This is the last judgment of all mankind at the end of the thousand years. I believe that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is on the throne. God the Father is judging the universe, men and angels through Christ on the great white throne. The scroll of life contains those, the names of those who have trusted in Christ. And the other scrolls contain a record of the works of what each person has done. The saints will be judged out of the scrolls or the books because they will be rewarded for their good works. But those who have not trusted in Christ will only be judged on the basis of their works, which will qualify them for being cast into the lake of fire. Truly horrible thought and one that certainly needs to be preached in our day and age. So the bottom line on the millennium there, I don't know how long I went, Michael, you can tell me, but the bottom line is that we are living in the millennium now, and that the thousand years represents the course of the era of gospel proclamation. I hesitate to call it church age, because dispensationalists use that in a technical sense. So I like to call it the era of gospel proclamation. We're living in the millennium now, and if you believe that, then the new heavens and the new earth just came a thousand years closer to you. End of discourse. Gotcha. Okay. All righty. So should we proceed right into the consummation, or should we ask a few questions about the millennium? What do you think, Josh? <laughs> I was expecting a few questions. Anyway, you budget your time, because the other one will take a little more yeah. time. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, down. All right, so um, sure. Why don't we go with, we had a question about the tribulation. Where do you peg the tribulation? Do you see it as taking up the full duration of the thousand years? Do you see something especially terrible at the end that you would call the great tribulation? Uh, how do you how do you categorize that? <laughs> and let me, let me post on that, that question, um, how would you understand the mark of the beast? Because that's another question that are... That okay, are, somebody wanted to know. So yeah, so we can go kind of go two of those at the same time. Tribulation slash mark of the tribulation, beast. Tribulation, mark of the beast. What's an all-mill perspective? The two together? Sure. I'll go on very briefly. The expression, the great tribulation, comes out of Revelation 7. And you see that there is the ceiling of the 144,000. That, I believe, the 144,000 represents God's elect, his, his, his holy people of all times, Old Testament and New Testament. And they have come out of the Great Tribulation. So the Great Tribulation began at the fall in the Garden of Eden. And the saints have been enduring tribulation ever since then. And we ourselves are going through Great Tribulation. And we will go through what I like to call the greatest tribulation at the end of the age because of this last battle. So I do not believe that that greatest tribulation lasts seven years. I don't think the Bible designates the time period. But the Lord Jesus did say that there will be, towards the end of the age, a tribulation greater than any that the world has ever seen before. And I will be describing that in just a moment. The mark of the beast is very simple, I think. <laughs> The beast is one of the three instruments of Satan, who is the dragon, and it represents the government to the extent that it is attempting to deify itself, to, to act as God. And of course, today, we are seeing the world racing towards the deification of the state in socialist and communist form. So that seems to be the trend that history is taking, and you do not want to be found worshiping the government. And you want to be found worshiping the Lord Jesus, then you will enter heaven safely and experience the first resurrection. Okay. Well, you kind of touched on it. I'm almost tempted to ask you for a few contemporary questions. I know amillennials tend to stray from that a little bit more from trying to make the exact one-to-one -one connection with uh, news headlines. But do you want to do that now or do you want to just do it at the end of the show? Well, it, it, 
anything that you'd like. Just keep our time constraints in mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Well, let's just ask that. Do you see some, you, you noted the deification of the state, which certainly you're not saying people are literally like bowing down and burning incense uh, to a president or something like that. But, uh, but you just mean idolizing political parties and, and so on. Could you make some more uh, contemporary connections? Where does, where does COVID fit? Where does, uh, you know, macroeconomic situations fit? Where is the antichrist alive today? You know, could he, can help out well, some of our brothers who want to hear and sisters who want to hear a little bit of the contemporary significance. Yeah, I, I will be very minimalistic on that. Now that I'm almost 75 years old, I've seen so many connections, you know, fall apart. But look, if you look at the macro picture, I can't help but feel that the trend of the world with its increased technological sophistication is moving towards some kind of a one world government, economy, religion, which is tied together electronically and so forth. You see this way back in Genesis, where God told the people to disperse. But Nimrod said, no, we don't want to disperse. We want to be a one world enchilada. We want to have a tower that will hold us together. And they began. Some people think that it was some kind of a ziggurat and they were worshiping the gods on the top of the tower. So, but, and we're actually muted during that time. So, sounds like the Skype connection is lost. <laughs> it was <laughs> muted. Oh, no. Yeah, I muted myself just then. He okay. doesn't like it when they try to see the European Union or the, war, or the global uh, enchilada. Dean. Okay, Dean. Oh, no. Dean. I'm going to have to cut you off. So what happened was we got cut off at the ziggurats. Um, I think uh, <laughs> we, got, we got cut off at the ziggurats. Uh, I've been so listening to a if you could revisit music. that whole ziggurat thing. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, the, yeah, back we got cut off. We're back now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, all I, I was saying is some people think that on the top of the tower that it was a, a place of worship. I don't know the answer to that. The Bible doesn't say that. But my point being that if you read Second Thessalonians and, and the advent of the Antichrist, it seems that he appears in an environment where the world is looking for some kind of a savior, a substitute savior, and the other representations of the Antichrist in Scripture suggest to me that for a season he will succeed to have a very fragile but real unity around the world with pretty much the church being the only odd man out. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, and then uh, one more question, Armageddon. So you mm. said they're going to, in the text it says they'll surround the beloved city. Um uh, could you just expand a little bit on what Armageddon is? Well, uh, I'm going to touch well, on that in a minute, but I'm happy to say it right now. Uh, if you, okay, if you're going to touch on it in a little bit, and I, I just gave away my part of my view too, because <laughs> well, millennials it, think that they surrounded the beloved city uh, as part of Armageddon. Fresh. I want to answer your question while it's fresh in your mind. If you go through the book of Revelation, you will see that there is a reference to the war at least five times. You'll see it in Revelation 11, where the beast comes out and goes to war against the two witnesses. You'll see it in Revelation 13, where the beast makes war on the saints. You'll see it in Revelation 16, which is where the Armageddon passage is. You'll see it in Revelation 19, where they're all making war against the Lamb and his followers. And then you see it in chapter 20, where the Gog and Magog are making, ref they're making war against the saints. So it's the last battle. That's all the Armageddon is. It doesn't have anything to do with Israel or Palestine or Megiddo. It's a symbolic representation of the world system coming against the church just before the return of Christ. Okay. Mike. Very good. You are being okay. very concise, and I know we could spend lots of time on that and answer lots more questions, but let's jump into talking about the consummation. Yep. 
All right. So here now, give me a budget, temporal budget here to speak, and I'll be trying to be very disciplined. Well, we 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 still have thirty minutes on our broadcast. If we need to go over, we're we're comfortable going. We over. can go over. And then people who don't have time to watch it later, you, there's this wonderful thing called YouTube where you can rewind. That's yeah, nice. Watch and it later. you're talking you're talking to two guys who did an eight hour New Year's Eve marathon. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're fine. We're pros. <laughs> we're professionals. <laughs> too old to go on too long. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here we go. The consummation. I call this the grand prize of biblical eschatology. And I, I also call it the blessed hope of the church. I, I want to say this very, very clearly. The blessed hope of the church, the consummation which occurs at the second coming of Christ, is one of the most powerful biblical doctrines that we have. If the Holy Spirit quickens it to us, it's an endless fountain of energy and joy and encouragement and preaching power. So I do feel it's very important to try to sort this out to the best of our ability. Let me give you a brief definition of the consummation, and, and I won't go into it in great detail, but this is my definition. Consummation is the goal and the wrap-up of all salvation history. It is the capstone of the exaltation of Christ. I'm going to emphasize that point. It's the final administration of God's judicial and redemptive dealings with the universe, life, and man. And it's the divinely appointed door through which the saints enter into the glories of the world to come. So don't panic. I'll be touching on some of those points again. The one that I want to emphasize today I felt was important for your listeners is that one of the greatest, if not the greatest purposes for God in the consummation is the exaltation of his son. We speak of Christ, his humiliation, it's his incarnation, his life on earth, his death on the cross, and his burial in the ground. And this is his, that is the low point of his humiliation. Then we speak of his exaltation, where he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, that's called the session, and he received all authority in heaven and earth. So he's reigning now as the exalted Son of God. But that isn't the capstone. The capstone of his exaltation is when he comes back. Right now, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. He's hidden, we're hidden in him, and it's very invisible. The horrible things that are said about the Lord Jesus on this earth, the way that he is uh, mocked and the way he is misrepresented by people who use his name, I consider that a part of his humiliation, and I'm just going to love it when he's glorified at the end of the age by coming back and showing up in the sight of all. Now, the way that God, I believe, decided to glorify his son was by concentrating the consummation around him. Think of Christ as the hub of a wheel and all of the various eschatological actions that occur at the consummation are like the spokes that just come out of the wheel. So I like to speak of this as the Christ-centered unity of the consummation. Now here's a few points to illustrate that. First of all, the Lord Jesus himself will administer every element of the consummation. At his return, he will raise the dead. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will destroy the present earth and its works by fire. He will create the new universe. He is at the center of it all. So hes I call that the dynamic unity of the consummation. It's the, the, it's, Christ is the power center, the agent of the consummation. The second point is that he will administer these things all at once. You don't want to miss this point. The premillennial scenarios, because they have a millennium sandwiched in between his first coming again and then his last coming again, it breaks it all up. It fractures it. But no, the Bible says there's one coming again, and all of these things happen at the same time. So that's the temporal unity of the consummation. Third point is that he's going to perform them all in one place. This is a very important point. He comes out of heaven, 
and he descends to the skies above the earth, and it is from there that he administers all of these actions. And I'll be talking about that in a minute when we get into the details, because that is an extremely important point. The, dis the dispensationalists have him coming down out of heaven, going back into heaven, coming down for the millennium. Some say he'll stay there. Some say he'll rule from heaven. Very confused. The amillennial view is that when he comes back from heaven, he has come home. He brings heaven with him. Oops, looks like it happened again. Michael, you want to you just read like heartbreaking comments of people who said <laughs> that other guy who's not Michael Roundtree? <laughs> one uh, second, it's about yeah. time for Josh, a uh, lower third. Uh, Josh, was referred name. To, Josh was Can referred to. Can you hear to, me at all there? Okay, there we, we got are. You we're back. back. We're back. We got we're you back. back. Here we go. Here we go. But I just I'm had not, to I'm let people honest. know that so, Josh was referred to in the comments as the not Michael Roundtree guy. It was hurtful. <laughs> Wounded deeply. <laughs> I got lost there. I got disconnected. Where did no, I stop? No, you're back. You're if back. If you could start back at Ziggurat, that would be great. No, I'm not just joking. Ziggurat. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. 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 That's <laughs> <laughs> Ziggurat. Okay, so uh, you were talking about how when Jesus comes back, he's coming home. So he's maybe you can. Home. And he's, I, I want to stress this because it just blows my mind. He becomes the physical center of the universe, just as he is the center of God's affections. And I just, I just love that thought so much. Okay, so he's coming back visibly, publicly. He's performing all of these amazing actions. And so the scripture is fulfilled that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ really is the Lord. They didn't think he was until he came back, but now they know he is to the glory of God the Father. So I'm going to give you a second to ask a question or two, but let me wrap this up by saying this is one of the reasons I love my amillennialism like my childhood teddy bear. It <laughs> is simple. It is understandable. It is glorious. It is powerful. And it just equips you to preach the gospel with such unction and with such effectiveness to the world around you. So the premillennial views, they break it up. I mean, the dispensational view, I, sorry, brothers, but I'm afraid that's the worst offender because you've got him coming back three times with all sorts of resurrections, transformations, judgments, and the poor sheep of God, they just get completely lost in a cloud. So the beauty of this is that it's simple, understandable, powerful, and it's just filled with the glory of Christ, and it gives his saints tremendous hope. All right, so we'll go on to the biblical scenario in just a second, but go ahead, and if you've got any questions, we'll, we'll do it. Sure. Um, you mentioned that the premillennial uh, eschatological paradigm has multiple comings, multiple resurrections, multiple mm -hmm. judgments. Could you unpack that a little bit more for us? Sure. Let's, let's take the dispensational system. First of all, he comes back secretly for his church. So there is a resurrection of the dead Christians, and I think at that time the Old Testament saints, I'm not sure if they get included. They may not because they're not technically part of Israel. But you have the transformation of the living saints. You've seen the movies. They all disappear, and they're gone for seven years. Then you have the second coming of Christ, and now you have a very special judgment. It's the judgment of the living nations, those people who treated the 144,000 evangelists nicely and received their message. And that, that judgment occurs. And at that time, there is another resurrection of the tribulation saints and uh, those who died in the tribulation. That may be the time when the Old Testament saints arise because then they get to go into the kingdom age. Then at the, set, at the end of the millennium, I don't know what they do about people who die during the millennium. Are they raised the day they die, or are they raised at the end of the millennium? I don't know. But there's another judgment at the end of the millennium, and there's another resurrection, maybe a transformation of the living saints. It just in injects an impossible confusion that is not suitable to sheep-like faith. Sheep are simple minded folk. <laughs> if, I guess they're not folk, they're flock. And, and they need simplicity. And I do believe God has, has honored that need by giving us a simple ex, uh, blessed hope 
that we can talk about, that we can share, that we can imagine at least to a degree. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my thought on that. Okay, and then uh, so you address the dispensational version of premillennialism, and then the historic premillennialism. Uh, do they have multiple? Uh, they have multiple resurrections, multiple oh, judgments, yes, absolutely. all the same. Second coming of Christ for the historic premillennarian, you mm-hmm. would have a resurrection of the dead Christians minimally, some historic premillenarians who emphasize Israel might wait on the Old Testament saints, but then you have a transformation of the living. And most people think that the children of the, it's the children of the, uh, of the Christians that will enter the millennium and then they and then they are the ones who are the inhabitants, the human inhabitants, rather than the glorified inhabitants. Then again, at the end of the millennium, you have another judgment, another resurrection, and another transformation. So minimally, you have two sets with that scenario. Okay. Well, so let's jump in. You said you had some more. So let's keep let's keep treading treading water. No, that's not the word. Let's get to that next section. Thanks. Get okay. Next. Section. Here we go. What I'm going to do, this is going to be a super short flyover. I'd encourage you, if you'd like, to read my book or one of the short essays uh, on my website. But I'm just going to give you the bare, the skeleton of it, but I hope some of the fire and some of the power of it. I'm going to start with the signs of the second coming of Christ. This is not really an element of the consummation. This is what happens prior, but... Naturally, most Christians are really interested in this, so I want to say a few words about it. I break the signs up into two categories. First of all, you have the beginning of birth pains. Jesus spoke of these in Matthew 24, and this is what are included in that category. You have wars and rumors of wars. You have famines. You have earthquakes. You have pestilence. and I'm sure COVID-19 fits right in there nicely. You have the problem of false Christs and false prophets infiltrating the churches, apostasy of false believers, and you have ongoing persecution of the true spiritual church. So Jesus told us that these signs are not something which, when we see them, we should jump to the conclusion that he's right around the corner. These are not signs of the imminence of his return. These are the signs that a great birth is about to occur. The old age is about to die in judgment, but the new heavens and the new earth is about to appear after the judgment. So it's very important for Christians to be preaching these things. I don't hear very much of it. But we should be preaching. I, try, I write letters to the editor in, uh, where I live in Santa Rosa. We've had some very serious fires. And I have written letters to the editor, one of which was published, where I said I tried to teach my generation that this was the providence of God allowing these fires through so that we could think a little bit about how we're living. And, our, and could this be a wake-up call for it's because there's so much that's going on in our community well, around us. Let me ask you this, Dan. When talking about the signs, you talk about this is the beginning of birth pains. Um, you're not qualifying these as tribulations, it seems, because you said tribulations start from the beginning of the garden. Since the garden till today, there's been that's tribulations. Right. Would you would you qualify these, and again, we talk about birth pains, if these are the initial signs, all of these things seem to have happened since the garden as well. Like, how is this going to be a sign of um, of Anything. the end? Of the end? I mean, pestilences have happened since the beginning, right? Famines have happened since Genesis. We've got ex- record records. Uh, you know, uh, certainly not false. I mean, false Christ. Yeah, that's happened too. Uh, Moses says, "Hey, there's going to be these guys who are going to come, claiming to be the new prophet that arises. That's going to instill this new and better covenant. They're going to lead you after false gods. Stone those guys. Uh, apostasy. All these things have happened since the beginning. Trying to lead people after." other gods, um, how am I to understand these eschatologically and not just um, other forms of tribulations within the the all-millennial perspective? Well, eschatologically, I think it's pretty simple. The signs are, are understood, I believe, by the Lord as judgments. 
but they mm -hmm. are judgments that are not final. They are judgments in the nature of chastisements. In the Revelation, they're referred to as trumpets. What does a trumpet do? It tries to wake people up to danger. Mm. So these are actually signs of God's love. He, and here in Santa Rosa, you have a very minimal loss of life, a lot of loss of property. And, and they are wake-up calls to examine our lives and to turn to Christ before the big fire comes. So this is, this is how I think we are to preach them. They are marks of God's mercy as well as, as of his judgment. And typically, there's a lot of mercy m melded in there, and I think we should be preaching these things. Now let me go on to the second category of signs. I call these uh, signs of the imminence of Christ's return. And these are very important because I believe these are signs which will strongly suggest that, yes, now he really is at the door. These are not generic signs that happen throughout the Great Tribulation, the Church era, the gospel era of gospel proclamation. If you see these things happening, then you know that the end is near. And now let me just inject here the doctrine of a pre-tribulation rapture destroys this emphasis in Scripture God wants to give us specific signs so that we can know that his coming is near. It's not a secret event. It isn't an any time, it can't, it isn't in any moment coming again. No, he wants us to know that when certain signs appear on the horizon, then you can be sure that the end is near. That's my conviction on this subject. Okay, I'm very briefly. The completion of world evangelization. Jesus said this gospel must be preached to every nation and then the end will come. I think that, I don't know exactly how you measure that. I'm, I, I find that challenging, but I will say that in an electronic era where the people in China never even had landlines, they all mm -hmm. have a smartphone, all 1 billion or 1.2 billion of them, I think the gospel is going to get through very quickly, and it will be preached to all nations, but right now I don't believe it has been. Uh, if you go to the Joshua Project online, you'll kind of get an update on this progress of the gospel. The second sign is the conversion of Latter-day Jews. I know this is a controversial subject, but I think in Romans 11, it's pretty clear that when God revisits his ancient Old Testament people at the end of the age, it, Paul says it will be life from the dead. And I consider that to be a strong hint that when you see the restoration of ethnic Israel to her Messiah in faith, it's not the second coming of Christ that will turn Israel to back to him. It's the preaching of the gospel that God will open their eyes and will restore them in great numbers to, to their Savior. I like to think of the Jews as the bookends of salvation history. It began with the Jews, it transitioned to the Gentiles, and it will end with the Jews. That's the big picture that I think that Paul gives us in Romans 11. The third sign is a little, a little more difficult to pin down, but I still think it's important. I call it deep and widespread lawlessness and spiritual darkness. Now, you would say to me, well, it's always dark out there, <laughs> you know, in the world, and that's true. But Jesus says that in the last days, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. And it will be like it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, how bad was that? It was very, very bad. The thoughts and the intentions of the minds of men were only evil always. And you have several depictions. I believe it's in 2 Timothy. Paul describes a little bit about what the people will be like in the last of the last days. So when you see gross and egregious decay in our culture, I think you are looking at something that could very well begin, at least, to qualify for the fulfillment of that sign. Hmm. Now, this next one is probably the most important, at least scripturally, and that would be the appearing of the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. Again, I know that you guys must have heard a thousand different views on this, but my persuasion is very simple. There is a real human being who is going to appear on the stage of history, and he will be a, a substitute Christ. He will be uh, an imitator of Christ. And he will. there will be a coming, there will be miracles, there will be a message, there will be a following. For all the world, it will look like another Jesus Christ. 
and for which reason we have to really, really be prayed up, and be saturated in Scripture, and, and have great discernment. That's why Jesus told us, he said, if they say he's out in the desert, don't go out there. If they say he's in the city, don't go in there. His coming of the Son of Man will be in the sky, it will be in the clouds as the light flashes from east to west. He says in, this, in the Mount of Olives discourse, he said, this guy Satan and maybe some of his followers will be able to perform miracles so powerful that it would deceive the elect if that were possible. So this is not a lightweight experience. This is very, this to me, is a very serious thing. And he will succeed in consolidating the world system around himself and will attack the church. And this will be the beginning of the last battle. And that's the last point that I want to make on the signs. The last battle, I have isolated at least 15 biblical texts that speak of this great conf conflict between the world and the church, between Christ and Satan. I don't believe it will last for a specific number of years. I don't think the Bible teaches how long that's going to be. But I do believe that for a short period of time, this will be the church's darkest hour. In Revelation 11, you have the two witnesses, and I think that they represent the true spiritual church at the end of the age. And it says that they will die and be laying in the streets of the city, spiritually speaking, Babylon and Egypt, not Babylon, spiritual Egypt and spiritual Sodom, where also their Lord died. In other words, the church will be attacked by the world system just as Jesus was. And it's not that everybody will die physically, but the visible church will be underground, the spiritual church will be completely marginalized, and for all practical purposes, the world will say the church is dead. And that new religion will be triumphant for a very short period of time. Because the beauty of this sign is that it signals that Christ is right around the corner to come and rescue his bride and bring the consummation. You want to ask some questions on that? Yeah, sure. So, okay, one question that comes into mind, and this probably comes back to how you define the Great Tribulation, but um, I, I think you used uh, the superlative greatest tribulation <laughs> uh, yes, to yes, describe yes. that final period of history. And I think about Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 7, I want to say verse 13, where it says these uh, people, this great multitude that no one could number from every tongue, tribe, and nation came out of the great tribulation. And some say, hey, this final period of human history, it'll be the darkest of times. It'll also be the greatest revival of all times. How do you pair that up with it looks like the church is dead, uh, like you just said, Revelation chapter 11. Or to borrow another uh, from another passage where Jesus says in Luke 18, I want to say verse 9, that uh, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So you seem to have these competing images of there's great revival and the church is dead. What, is, what does that look like in your mind? Yeah, that's a very good question. I do not anticipate a great revival. Okay. The uh, Revelation 7 the great multitude is the totality of saints of all time, from the Garden of Eden, from Abel, right up to our day. But the trajectory of church history, as we reach the, as we reach the consummation, seems very clear to me to be uh, one of apostasy. Mm -hmm. oh, and there it goes again. So the la it's, it's not... You're, you you cut out again. So the last thing I heard from you was it's ziggurat. Not, no, sorry. Yeah. So to. so catching you back up. You said uh, it's not that of a revival. It's that of apostasy. What you see in the latter times, which I think um, is there's. I think everyone agrees that everyone agrees that there is a great falling away. Someone would just say, yeah. We except also the, think the post millennials are kind of like it's a yeah, blip on the radar. Except for the post millennials, we, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, who was it we had on the show talk about post millennials? Yeah, yeah, Doug the, Wilson. The, the we had Doug Wilson come on. He he said it gets a little bad at the end, but not so bad. And we just you know, and then it's gonna be great. What is it? Uh, <laughs> I want to say was it? I want to say Sam Storm said the difference between a post mill and an on mill guy is that an all mill is a realist and a post mill is an optimist. Yeah. I think I think he said that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's let's pick back up there. You say you see a great apostasy, not a great revival. We'll pick up there. Okay, uh, I want to make sure I heard you, Josh. Can I am I going on now in my Sure, sure, yeah. Or should 
Yeah, please do. Uh, you just left off with uh, you saw a great uh, a great apostasy, not a great revival. Sorry for the disconnection. I think we're there. getting to um, now we're get, we're touching now on the element of the and I'll be brief here. Again, the core, the hub, the center of the consummation is the thing of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one of them. At the time of his coming, the first great event is the resurrection of the dead, which the scripture represents as a general resurrection. All who have ever lived and died will rise again. John chapter 4 says, all who are in the tombs, he will, the Son of Man will call forth. At that time, according to 1 Corinthians 15, there is the transformation of the living saints, those who have not died, Again, I the return of the Lord. I hope you guys are among them. God bless you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> thrilled if you were. Okay. Now, the next thing catching up of all humanity this is a little different. This is where the dispensations would start to speak about the rapture. But if you study the scriptures carefully, it is not only the church, the elect, that is gathered up to be to meet the Lord in the air. If you see Matthew 13 in the parable of the wheat and the tares, you see that the we might we might have to uh, do a closing thoughts here in a second if we keep having internet connections. Might try this one more time. Yeah, here. for sure. Yeah, do we have you back? Dean? Are you back with us, Dean? Sorry, guys. We we'll apologize. Here, you you, uh, you you talk to the peoples, and I'll I'll get him back on the Skype call here. <laughs> oh, is he back? Dean, you back? No. Nope. Okay. Go okay. ahead. Well, um, if you end up getting him back on, then we, we might try it one more time. But um, it really came down to, his answer came down to the Great Tribulation and how you define it. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, that's interesting about viewing the Great Tribulation is um, is comprising of the entire period from the fall. Mm -hmm. um, you know, personally for me, I, I I put it like this: I I think that the Great Tribulation, when you look at Daniel chapter twelve, oh, he's back. Are you back? Can we hear he him? Is. Can it we says hear him? Speaker muted. Uh, okay. I didn't mute him. Can you hear me, Dean? No. Okay. Uh, I'll just talk and uh, and share my thought. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, it talks about how there will be this uh, terrible time like no other in world history. Jesus quotes, uh, alludes to that exact passage in Matthew 24 and just in all the passages about the Olivet Discourse. And then you see it again in Revelation chapter 7. And so for me personally, I would view the Great Tribulation as future, but then uh, you can also look at uh, at tribulation in terms of like maybe like lowercase t tribulation is what I call it. Like in Revelation chapter one verse nine, I think it is. John says uh, John refers to the seven yeah. churches. He says, "My brothers and partners with me in tribulation." So there's I, I call it the difference between lowercase t tribulation and great tribulation. And it sounds like Dean refers to it as kind of like great tribulation and greatest tribulation, but neither here nor there, I suppose. Yeah, uh, Dean, uh, I think mm -hmm. that you've you've come in and out, and just, uh, since people were were watching, I think you've come off and on uh, like two or three times. Uh, so, uh, like like in the last two minutes, uh, you, you've come, your calls come in and out. So, um, I think we should try and probably do like a closing thought and try to wrap this up quickly, um, just so in case. The things get disconnected again. Um, let, me, let me give you a second to give closing thoughts, if you would, and you're gone again. So, so uh, I'm, I'll give a closing you can thought. Give a closing thought. And I'll, I'll give, give a closing him, thought, yeah. and then um, I feel bad for the internet. Sorry, yeah, guys. Yeah, sorry, guys. Okay, so let me just kind of summarize what we uh, what his arguments were. Um, he, he said there's really four four issues when it comes to understanding uh, or resolving the end times debate. Do we already have him back? He's back. Okay. Dean, you want to give us some closing thoughts? Sorry. 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 Yeah, we're going to have you just give some closing thoughts because the internet signal is bad. So um, do you think you could wrap it up in just uh, two minutes? Just kind of share your closing thoughts. Just what do you want people to really... Nope. Nope. That's okay. it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Let me just summarize yeah. then uh, the his call. arguments. 
uh, four issues, and this is whether you land premillennial, uh, and there's two major versions of that dispensational premillennial that believes in a pre-tribulational rapture. Then there's historic premillennial, uh, which does not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, believes that the rapture and the second coming are simultaneous. But the reason they're both called premillennial is that Jesus comes back pre, before the millennium. Mm -hmm. And they believe a in a literal thousand-year reign of Christ. Some of them believe the thousand years is symbolic of a long period of time. Uh, George Ladd uh, falls into that category, a great scholar of the pre-millennial, historic premillennial uh, viewpoint. Anyway, so kind of the way most people talk about it is they'll just talk pre-trib, post-trib, and they just assume that uh, that premillennial, that like surely you're premillennial, it's just pre-trib, post-trib, which one is it for you? <laughs> um, and what Dean Davis has been talking about is the amillennial perspective. And, uh, and so that... Uh, uh, people who are on millennial often pr prefer the term realized millennium or inaugurated millennium. And that is the idea that ever since Christ's ascension, he has reigned that the millennium, the thousand years is symbolic and Christ is presently reigning. And, and so uh, he went through four uh, items, four sort of categories to think through in determining whether we're going to be a premillennialist or an awe, and we could say slash postmillennial because those are pretty close. Um, and uh, are we premillennial or are we not premillennial? And uh, the first one is understanding the nature of the kingdom. And uh, and so the way he worded it is 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 it's a two stage process. There's the present age and then the age to come. Whereas he would say the premillennial seems to view uh, there as being three ages: the present age plus an intermediate millennium after Christ returns, and then a th kind of eternal state. And uh, and he says the New Testament. He calls it the, did did the didactic literature of the New Testament. Um, that's not just him that calls it that, but that uh, it would seem to put it in this age and the age to come. So he says, first, you have the nature of the kingdom. Second, you have Old Testament kingdom prophecies. And uh, and that is, how do we understand these Old Testament kingdom prophecies that that seem to be uh, talking about this like future golden age or like, like agriculturally prosperous and so on. And um, the premillennial will say, well, that's the thousand year reign of Christ. And the amillennial says that's symbolic. So how do we do, how do we decide whether these Old Testament kingdom prophecies are literal or symbolic? His answer is we look at how the apostles interpreted those Old Testament kingdom prophecies. And he says they interpreted it symbolically, therefore, so which should we? Um, Third, he talked about uh, the millennium, and he talked through Revelation chapter 20, and he believes, as do all millennials, you're smiling at me. No, I just think it's hilarious that you've you've read 50 books on eschatology, and literally any any guest on eschatology could have ended their stream mid-go, and you could have done I their whole keep spiel going. for them. <laughs> I think it's insane. No, so, keep going. Um, <laughs> He, he talked about the, the placement of Revelation 20, and the real big decision, premillennials understand Revelation 20 as being more literal and also sequential to Revelation chapter 19. So Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, and then in chapter 20, you have a thousand-year reign. And so they under, uh, premillennial will say, well, it's just natural to read this sequentially. Because 20 comes after 19, right? And um, whereas the amillennial will say, well, no, not so fast. It's not sequential. It's actually replaying salvation history. He gave some reasons for why he believes that. Last of all, the consummation, that's the blessed hope, the return of Jesus, Titus chapter 2. And so um, that and that's the the end of all things. You keep smiling at me. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, smi stop, I'm smiling. I'm, I'm smiling. Stop. I'm smiling at the guy comment, next to at me. the comment section. Oh, um, uh, someone get someone talking trash. No, he says, "Don't worry about it. All dogs go to heaven." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty no, good. I think I think it was a great episode. I wish uh, internet connection was a little bit more solid. I uh, would have loved to hear Dean uh, do a closing statement with us. So apologize for you guys who are watching. Yeah, uh, who yeah, expected sorry. that. But hey, it's you got of the you got two episodes right. of an amillennial perspective. Uh, if you're interested in pre-trib rapture, if you're interested in post-trib, look at a post-trib from the premillennial perspective. Right. Look up Dr. Keener. Uh, he did. What, what did we title that one? Why I'm not pre-trib? I think. Yeah, disproving <laughs> the pre-trib rapture. Yeah, it was actually really funny. Uh, Dr. Keener. He. <laughs> can I say this? No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, he emailed us. He said, "You know, I noticed that on your most popular 2020 episodes, you had Jimmy Evans 
pre-trib rapture episode, but you didn't have mine post-trib rapture episode. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there so, was there was a couple people. Uh, I was just proud that Dr. Keener watches our episodes. Oh yeah, no, he he'll send me an email every once in a while and be like, "Hey, way to go with that one." Um, I thought it was pretty great. Uh, anyway, for those of you who are watching, you want some of our commentary on episodes like this, uh, go check out our Patreon for five bucks a month. Uh, as low as five bucks a month, you can give to our ministry every single month. Um, are you Comments, dude. They're hilarious. <laughs> I can't. I'm in the middle of a spiel, Michael. I can't read Someone the said, what a ripoff, not Michael guy. Jeez, <laughs> Louise. Um, uh, y- you guys can uh, uh, give there on Patreon. You can give a one-time gift there on PayPal. Uh, but man, uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Here's a lower third that says to do that. Uh, like, subscribe, uh, maybe even share the video to people who may be interested. Uh, as we're coming out with content con- constantly just like this, you want to make sure to subscribe. Yep. Uh, lots of great stuff coming down next the pipe. Week, yep. Next week, we have a professor from Dallas Theological Seminary. He's going to yep. be on uh, Spiegel, right? Yes, Dr. Michael Spiegel, and he is going to be talking about urban legends of church history. I'm almost finished with his book. Oh, goody. I believed all those urban legends that he corrected me on. Dang. Like, they're literally in history books. People writing, he's like, that's actually not quite what happened. Dang. It is fascinating. Okay, so that's going to be From exciting. beginning to end of church history. Um, we booked uh, John Thomas. He's been rescheduled to the end of the month, but he's booked. He got, um, he got the COVID. That's right. Josh Hoffert. Um, is coming on. Uh, Matthew Esquivel is coming on. Uh, we also have booked uh, quite a few. Uh, Anthony Skuma, who came on and did yeah, the Assemblies of God. That's a popular one. Uh, uh, the History of the Assemblies of God is coming back on and talk about uh, the history of the Assemblies as it relates to race uh, in the month of February, which is going to be interesting because the Assemblies um, started as a Pentecostal movement that was very uh, ethically diverse. And then some of the, uh, the the kind of racial tensions that happened during its inception kind of split it a little bit. And then they became more the inclusive. Save it for the episode. Some really cool it's stuff. Be, be, again, an important discussion. History, yeah. the gifts of the Spirit, and theology from various church uh, denominations is what we're here for. So uh, you're going to get a lot of the history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit here on the channel. Um, going tomorrow to Colorado to build the studio for Miller. Yeah, Michael Miller. So starting that Gifts of the Spirit podcast. And we need ideas for, for, names. Pod, for names of this podcast. It's still going to fall under the Remnant channel, so you'll be able to find it. Yep. Um, but it's we're going to brand it just a little bit differently, and we need a name for it. We need a name for a Gifts of the Holy Spirit podcast. So give us your names. Yeah, drop them in the comment section or in the live chat. I'd love to hear them. Uh, I, but I think that's it. We've kind of we've just been shooting the breeze here at the end. Yeah, well, you know, we're having fun. We love you guys. That's how, how we do. That's how we do. Check you guys later. Peace. God bless.